Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you might be tuning in from today. If you are joining us live, if you're listening to this, this is a live episode of our Crypto Winter podcast series. Joining me today is Trevor Marshall, the CTO at Current. Uh, before I jump into uh, our discussion with Trevor, uh, we'll do some quick intros and then start our conversation. Just wanted to let those know um, that who are joining us live, uh, that we do encourage questions. So please uh, ask questions if you have them at any point during the half hour. Uh, and for those listening, this is a, a series of interviews that we're doing with leaders in the crypto, fintech, and banking space about kind of what's going on in the current crypto winter, how that might impact long-term growth of the space, uh, and what it means for the various players. Uh, and as a reminder to the audience who's watching or listening, we have our Merge by Fintech Nexus event live in London, October 17th and 18th. It's in person at the Tobacco Dock in London and Merge, which is merging Web3, Fintech and banking into one room with leaders from all three areas. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it to my guest today, Trevor, for some quick introductions. Trevor, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Current. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's exciting to be part of the crypto winter series. Um, definitely not the first crypto winter and definitely not the last. Um, yeah, I'm Trevor Marshall. I'm the CTO here at Current. Uh, we're a challenger bank here in the U.S. We build banking services, um, technology services. Um, our roots are actually the group about seven years old, and our roots are very much in crypto, it's where we started. Um, we've sort of interacted with the space tangentially throughout the years, and we're actually rolling out a crypto investment product currently to about 30,000, 40,000 users so far, and we're rolling that further out um, to more and more people fully integrated sort of within our banking platform. So um, I'm excited to talk about this. It's something that's near and dear uh, to my heart. You know, to pick up on, on what you were saying there, obviously you mentioned the investment product, but tell us a little bit about the history with Current and Web3. I mean, from, from what I understand and what you've told me in the past, you guys were you know, very much seeing the future at the time and um, understanding that this technology, blockchain, and, and the push towards Web3 would be important, and you built Current with that in mind from the beginning. That's correct, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like the very short history, and it's a, it's important because it, it ties into sort of my views and the way that I, I look at what's happening now. Um, but really, the story of Current starts from right when I came out of school and and right when I got hired at, at Morgan Stanley. So who's current CEO? Um, hired me there. He's been my boss my whole career. Um, but what he had seen, uh, you know, he started his career in 99 and he had seen the dot-com boom. He had seen three or four major financial crises. And before even like today, where you can see the deglobalization that's happening, you know, we've got Pelosi in Taiwan today. Um, we've got all sorts of things kind of cooking around the world that that sort of start fracturing this, this, this global system that had been put in place uh, post-World War II. That's a trend that's been happening for a while. And the deterioration from Stewart's perspective is one of sort of macroeconomic consequence, which is what is the world in sort of this post petrodollar, you know, US hegemony system that we've been operating in for, you know, 50-ish years and more explicitly in like the fiat system since the 70s. Um, and so out of school, I was really excited about Bitcoin. I, you know, I went to school here in New York. New York was an amazing place uh, for Bitcoin in 2011, 2012, 2013. Um, and, you know, I ended up on a foreign exchange desk because there wasn't really a career path for that enthusiasm. Um, and you know, luckily, I met Stuart and the things that he was excited about or, and interested in or the things I was excited about and interested in. When he left Morgan Stanley, I followed him and we were doing some Bitcoin trading. We were doing some FX trading. But ultimately, with this shift and this move away from sort of the, the world order and in particular, the monetary backbone of, of the world, we were thinking about what comes next. Like the internet is an undeniable sort of technological force that connects the whole world. And it's it's going to be pretty much impossible to revert that. that. That change, even though there's attempts that are made where, you know, segments of the internet are cut, cut off. Fundamentally, there's sort of a, a Pandora's box, which has been opened and, and can't be closed. 
Um, and so what our thinking is, is if, if there's this major macroeconomic shift that's happening, that's going to flow into what is the next money. And if the internet is, if that, that trend in terms of like globalized communication is happening, our hypothesis is that the next reserve is something around internet money. And what that looks like is still only starting to become more and more clear. And it's definitely not well-defined, but that was sort of the, where our head was at. And we wanted to be in a place of helping to sort of deliver that major, major shift in the way that the world works to everyday users. You know, both of us had I had, you know, I had a very short career before that point, but like, uh, you know, I, I started in trading. He had spent his whole career in trading. We were more interested in getting into that. How do we build stuff, create value um, and be a part of that, that transition. And so in those early days when we were building new consumer products, we were thinking in terms of what is banking post banks, even like post sort of the, the way that the system exists, what could that look like? And some of the early prototypes we built were literally taking dollars and putting them into a digital form. We were doing it on Ripple at the time. And the concept is, you know, proto stable coin, um, you have digital dollars reflecting sort of a, a reserve, which was literally like a safe in our office where you could give us cash. Um, and in 2015, like everything, you know, at that point there had already been probably I mean, the, the, the major winter of like the Mount Gox era and sort of the collapse um, that followed that. But there had been other, like at that point, I think Bitcoin had been through two major hard forks. Um, there had been like a lot of doubt that was cast on Bitcoin. Um, and so this was already this trend, this crypto winter thing in, in 2015 was already something that, you know, you'd seen two or three cycles of uh, already at that point. Um, but in those days in 2015, it was mostly promised for what the, the product could be and what the what the future system could be. And so we we kind of took stock of where we were at and we ended up building a lot of financial technology that could connect <clears throat> connect both to um, a crypto backend but also a fiat backend. And that kind of brings our product up to today where we operate our own core banking engine. We're able to kind of interact with different financial substrate. And that's really the edge. So as we're bringing crypto trading in now, and the sort of the investment product, it's natively integrated with that with that banking core. So, that's a quick background on 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 my perspective. Uh, and for those listening live, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A uh, box in your Zoom window, and we can ask those to Trevor uh, in the next few minutes. I did want to um, ask, kind of, you know, with today, you know, what's been the biggest impact you've seen thus far in this version of the crypto winter? Um, and, you know, how different is, is today's crypto winter from previous iterations of it? Um, you know, it feels to me from someone who's on the outside looking in and kind of covering the industry that there's less of a, um, a negative feel towards crypto itself as if it won't happen. There seems to be somewhat yeah. of an ine inevitability that we're moving in this direction, which is different from years past. Uh, but what have you seen as someone that, that's building and working with the technology every day? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the winter is pretty much defined by Bitcoin price action and everything else follows that. And so if you're looking at like major sort of waves in the price action, the last one of these was 2017, 2018, sort of post ICO craze into 2018 and the collapse that happened there where Bitcoin was around like 18,000 or so. Um, what was, there was high panic in those days. Um, a lot of that panic was, you know, you had the Litecoin collapse right around then. And a lot of that panic was around, wow, we've just experienced, like that was probably one of the biggest runs. I mean, that was the biggest run in a percentage basis that, that, that the space had ever seen. And there wasn't a ton of fundamental value. Basically at that point, what had been discovered was ICOs are a cool way or an alternative way to raise money globally. Like that was a pretty major innovation. But at the same time, you had a pretty immediate reaction from sort of a regulatory perspective on like, eh, this is probably not super kosher and it isn't, there's not a lot of consumer protection. All of those things are true, but there wasn't a lot of other things going on. Now, what pulled us out of that last winter was actually DeFi. And so this was basically, you started to see on-chain financial applications that actually created value for people in the network. And this was actually one of the things that started bringing current back towards um, crypto again is because now what we're seeing in every year, of course, like we're crypto DNA, like this is what I love personally and it's what Stuart loves and like, but we had really resisted the temptation of starting to sort of reintegrate 
um, with with crypto systems because the value still wasn't there. And that's something that we had identified even in 2015. But 2020 and when Compound came out and a lot of the other ecosystem started started emerging and you know certain protocols like um, you know Polkadot being this like new layer zero concept with shared consensus mechanisms like certain things started emerging out of this that were really exciting and I think that ultimately gave enough confidence to trigger the last bull run. Now a lot of that last bull run was just a function of liquidity and I would say mostly what defines the situation we're in now is a broader than crypto event. So in 2018 you had a fairly you know, uh, uncorrelated drop in Bitcoin. This year, what we've got is you've got tech stocks down, you've got basically the entire S&P down, and you've got the result of effectively Fed rate raising and the, the sort of consequences of liquidity no longer being as abundant as it was previously. And so I think that the, peop the view that most people have around like, well, crypto isn't fundamentally broken. There are some things that were revealed in sort of this pull, this pull out of liquidity and I'd be happy to talk about like those things in particular, but from a from a sort of starting place, it's a little exogenous to crypto itself. It's kind of like everything that's happening around it. And you could also say kind of everything that was happening around it was also the reason for the sort of massive rise in price that happened before. Um, in terms of like what is actually getting revealed, I think the defining characteristic of this is just how leverage was being used in different places and those are most prominent in sort of the the, the like the CFI lenders right where you've basically got mm -hmm. um loans and centralized counterparties um expanding their um their balance sheets um and and doing certain actions which you know sort of banks and other you know partic market participants would do and the failures there are more indicative of okay there's been a lot of sort of financial maturity that's happened um, but not a lot of uh, of the same sort of risk controls and things that come with sufficient time to understand what those risks would be. So that's what you're seeing, like in terms of the failures um, that are happening. Um, but at the same time, you're still seeing DeFi failures, like Nomad yesterday or the day before. It's like there are still fundamental issues that we're working out, and it's like it's easy to forget, for example, that Ethereum Classic exists because there was a bug in basically one of the early DAOs, like one of the early contract types that exist that is since, you know, we've since learned from. And bugs like this are going to continue to happen. And those I actually think are separate from sort of the market dynamics that are happening. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's what I think makes this one uh, different than the last one. And some of those market dynamics and, and even the, the C5 lender um, issues and in a lot of ways, you mentioned risk. I mean, they, they relate back to bets made by people um, to, all right, let's put it in illiquid uh, positions, some of this leverage. And when things start to hit the fan, they can't take some of these instruments out. And then they're left with this gap of, of liquidity that they can't make up. And, and obviously people are then get scared and, and want to take their money out. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the the some issues uh, with DeFi. I mean, we hear a lot on, you know, DeFi has yet to quote unquote break. You hear some of this and maybe the, the more crypto enthusiast side of, of uh, the ledger um, and the issues with CeFi. I mean, where would you say the technology is today? Um, and, you know, when we think about DeFi, quote unquote, not breaking, or at least how some people, um, you know, define it, um, how do you see it from your perspective um, of DeFi versus CeFi and how these two areas are ultimately going to play together sometime in the near future? Yeah, I think they're, it's, they're pretty intrinsically linked, right? Even when you look at DeFi, there are humans creating that contract code. Right. And even though it operates in a, in a more transparent way, which I think ultimately benefits the entire ecosystem, like trying to put as much of the logic into a public place as possible so that everyone can agree upon the what's being run is a good thing. At the end of the day, it's still something that, you know, humans are, are pushing all of these things forward and and and, and out. Um, I think like stablecoin is like a, a good example or a good way to sort of talk about the differences here. I think when you look at what happened at Luna, like uh, 
Terra USD operated sort of as expected. There were other issues um, like that are sort of structural, like the way as expected probably wasn't the right way. I mean, clearly wasn't the right way based on, on the results. Um, but when you look at the other alternatives, like the true on-chain, like uh, DAI, for example, and, and sort of the over collateralized stable coins like AUSD. So that's a, like a Kala's uh, stable coin. These ones all operated perfectly, you know, and, and they, they took this similar approach of like the logic for how this thing is going to work is going to be public, but the underlying mechanism and assumptions were just better than, than sort of what existed in the, the Terra USD. There are challenges with the fiat stable coins, which represents more of like the CFI angle here, but there's also massive advantages. Like the massive advantages are you've got some level of audit control. You've got some level of exogenous capital, aka actual dollars representing the dollars. So you move yourself away from, well, what happens when Bitcoin and everything else collapse, collapses 95% in the over collateralized stable coin world. But what's exciting is that even through this, this sort of major fall in prices where your collateral for these over collateralized on-chain stable coins would be at risk, the liquidations and sort of all of those operations are operating well. So one of the benefits of, of these things is you actually get to see these systems functioning because in, in a lot, when, when everything was rallying over 2021, um, you couldn't really test the, the bounds of liquidations on, on things like combat. There just wasn't really the opportunity to do it as much. There were some early in the year. Um, but you're really now starting to see the, the the wheat from the chaff kind of situation in terms of on-chain implementations. What isn't being tested as much are the fiat implementations because they don't get tested by these types of environments. They get tested by other types of things like you know fundamental issues with reserves and things that are happening outside of the actual crypto space itself, potentially like regulation and and other and other factors. So yeah, I think that the way that these things play together, ultimately, I think DeFi gets more proven out in markets like these because more stresses are put onto the system because they're usually DeFi is is really linked pretty intrinsically to a lot of on-chain activity, like just that's the definition effectively of it. Um, and the CeFi stuff on the lending side, that's really proven out and like com proven out and like disproven out, I should I yeah. should say, <laughs> um, in, in certain uh uh, management strategies, but other areas like USDC, for example, has held up amazingly well through this because like the fundamental mechanics of it are very good, which is you've got a reserve, you've got an audited reserve, you've got a digital representation, and now you've got like actually a very clean way of minting and burning um, those assets. So it's, it's definitely a mix of things. I mean, isn't, do we at times overanalyze some of this, because to, to some extent, I mean, this is what happens in a, a new market. It things get figured out, things break. Um, hopefully, it don't it, they don't break to the point where it, it induces systemic risk to other areas of the economy. But things don't break. Uh, things break. People figure out different ways that they work. Um, you know, it's it seems as if DeFi or, or even crypto generally has this bar that it needs to reach when other markets have had you know a significantly longer period of lead time to figure themselves out um i mean is some of this that it's you know some of the market has made it that oh this is going to transform everything so quickly and that that's hurt it in some ways i mean how how do you view some of the you know kind of criticism of the market overall and versus, you know, kind of just building the way that markets build, which is good and bad will happen. And over time, things get worked out and things get fixed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think like there's this, um, the, I forget who, who this quote is from, but it's like this kind of this truism in markets, you know, in the short term markets are a voting machine in the long term, they're a weighing machine. Um, and so really <laughs> what that what that gets towards is the fact that I fundamentally believe that what's happening in this space transforms the way that money works. And over time, that value will, will be discovered properly. Right now, we're very much in the way that markets operate in a day-to-day -day basis is that voting machine. Like, up, oh, uh, Fed liquidity, great. Let's just go and buy some Bitcoin. Um, uh, I heard about a hack on something that's unrelated to sell, like, like that, that mm -hmm. thing, because that's how I feel it should work. And right now, if you look at it from a pure price perspective and like a technical perspective, 
even on a pretty long term, we're in the middle of price discovery for crypto, which is to say the value hasn't been properly identified or one of the reasons it hasn't been identified, you could argue, is it hasn't been built yet. But there's a fundamental here, which is open systems are better than closed systems because yep. open systems can be openly interrogated and improved. Closed systems are impossible to improve outside of people who operate within the closed system and they have an incentive to make sure that sort of that stays closed and and that 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 has been proven out many many times so there is a fundamental trend here which is we are moving towards open financial systems open financial systems will create more opportunities for people in a fairer way and over time that value will go in that direction it's it's basically the same as like if you have a great product ultimately Yes, you can spend a lot of on marketing in the short term and 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 sort of gain ad advantages through the expenditure of budget, but ultimately your product is the thing that carries you into that space of being the thing that people use because it is the the best product. And I I do believe that there is this self-correcting action that happens in markets where over time you get to that weighing machine state of like the value is here and it will be valued over time. So that's also to say like why we're finally, after you know seven years of building this company, actually starting to make some crypto assets available for our customers. I think this is a good opportunity to get into the market because I do fundamentally believe that over time that value will accrue. And so, yeah, that's like um, a big part of you know our perspective and what we're building here at Current Two. What are um, what are some of the the most interesting products and developments that you've seen recently? Um, and, you know, what do you think, or how do you think they're going to impact, um, not only the crypto space, but, but broader finance? Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a couple of different areas to that on the technical side. Um, there's the consensus mechanisms and the progress that's happening there. You know, I'm really, I'm excited to see, um, proof of stake come to fruition. I'm a little nervous for it on Ethereum candidly. I think there are some very, very difficult technical challenges that, that are attempting to be solved that will only be proven out in production. But there's also like sort of all of the um, basically level above the scalability that's been created by zero knowledge rollups and, and other types of basically being able to scale off chain in a verifiable way are exciting. I think consensus mechanisms like delegated proof of stake in Polkadot and then the, the companies building on top of there like Akala, like those, there are some really interesting technical things that open up scalability and open up sort of the opportunity for products to get built. But I think outside of that, there is a just an overall consumer sentiment and, and awareness that is rising to the top. So as an example, there, you know, we try to listen to our customers as, as much as possible. And crypto trading was like one of the most requested features. Like this is very, very different than the types of surveys that we ran two or three years ago even. And so there the more exciting development to me personally is you know operating with out uh, in a consumer company is there's a a a large wave change that's happening in terms of the way that people see this technology and see the the potential value in this technology um so i think that's probably one of the most exciting developments uh if uh, anyone has uh, additional questions we've had one um come in um uh, please put them in we have a couple minutes left here uh the question that did come in from devin um how do you view current's future in the next uh year to five years uh how will you differentiate yourself uh to get more users and um you know how does the the digital banking landscape change um and and how are you guys viewing some of those changes yeah, so basically the way that we look at what we're building with Current is effectively as a concierge for your money, which is ultimately money goes where it's treated best and we need to be able to create the tools and opportunities for people to improve no matter where they are sort of in their um, journey towards progress, effectively financial progress. Um, for us, the way that we accomplish that is through te technological differentiation. We're operating out of this by maintaining our own core. We're effectively what that means is that we can control all of the funds flows and all of the financial product experiences that happen. And not just sort of like the way the app looks or the way that you know um, certain features operate. It's like you know fundamental differentiation, and that allows us to do things like real time settlement from Bitcoin to dollars and making sure that people can you know immediately have access to their money. And that extends those product areas extend to other parts of you know, 
financial needs. And so we're we completely focused just on core banking, which is basically getting your paycheck, being able to make payments. Um, we launched a, a, an ability to get a, a high yield uh, savings rate, which has been you know huge for our customers, adding in sort of this crypto and this axis of ownership. Over the next one to five years, we just want to push on all of these fronts. And in particular, we want to push on making sure that all the products that we launch are very well integrated with each other. I think one of the, the big things that we see when we look at sort of the more traditional banking landscape is there's a very, like, Everyone will know if they've opened up one of their like top 10 banking apps, there's a very a vertical silo that happens around every single one of those products. You're reapplying to all sorts of products. There's no data that's shared across these things. And they they really operate as fundamentally separate businesses because yeah. that's how they're structured. Like there's separate business owners, there's separate sort of teams supporting each of these things. The opportunity for us is to really have that fully horizontal platform to, to release these products on. Uh, last question um, from me. What what scares you most or or what is, do you think the biggest barrier to kind of this wide scale uh, adoption of, of not only crypto, but kind of this move towards a web three future? Many people say it's regulation, but are there other things out there beyond just, just the regulatory issues that you seek that could potentially really hamper uh, and stop yeah. this kind of trend that we're seeing? So I think regulation is often sort of pointed to um, as a blocker, but I actually fundamentally believe that regulators operate to protect consumers. And I've been working in this space now for, for, for many years, and I think it's very easy to go, well, regulators are trying to stop things from happening. But actually, the experience that I've seen so far is that they're usually coming from the right place. And so like, I actually don't think that's a big issue because over time, if it's valuable to consumers, it will be something that regulators want to support ultimately. And also regulators want to have a diversity of options for people. So like, I am not totally, like that's not the thing that I'm worried about. Actually, I think the thing that is most important and it's not really a worry, it's just a matter of time is we have to get the product experiences right in this space. You know, for people who are deep in crypto, like for example, I love all of these super technical, like almost academic, things that are happening in terms of consensus mechanisms and and like mechanisms for message passing like i love that stuff but most people don't care at all about that <laughs> stuff really the thing that is required to break through is products that people relate to and products that people get value from and until that happens you don't get you don't get the mainstream and so what it requires is it requires people who understand those things but then also understand what people want and start from what is the problem not here is the crypto solution. Where is my problem? Because yeah. that's kind of like, and I know that very deeply because that's kind of how we started. We started from this place of crypto is going to change everything, right? And we created these prototypes and did these things. But ultimately, we had to get back to what are what is what are problems that exist, get really deep in that problem set, and only bring the solutions when it makes sense. And so I think having that mentality, it's just a matter of time. There's tons of really smart people in the space yeah. One of the nice things about the crypto price action is you get smart people moving towards the space. Um, and so I'm sure it will happen. It's just a matter of time. And ultimately, that is the only blocker, in my view, to actually making it mainstream is building great products. Well, Trevor, I appreciate you taking a few minutes and coming on our special podcast series. Wish you and the team and Stuart and everyone a current continued success. Uh, look forward to getting you back sometime in the future. Awesome. Great to see you, Todd.